gentlemen, uh, we we are live, uh, and we have Paul, which is awesome. So we are also sold out tonight. So I'm going to have to ask you if you can possibly squeeze up, get close to your neighbour, free up a single seat if you can. Keep a sit here. We're finally we have seats here. If you can move in, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. Now. Has everyone got their app downloaded? And I'm looking at you online too. And I'll <laughs> say hello to you in a little bit, but just to start, have everyone got their app? Hands up if not. All right, everyone's got a headset? Hands up if not. Has everyone got the app and headset working together? Hands up if not. Okay. You can seriously, just put your hands up. We have volunteers who will come and assist. Keep your hands up, nice and raised. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Yes. And we especially want to recognize that these peoples were probably some of, if not the very first astronomers, as they looked up into the night sky and were able to recognize the patterns that they saw and really actually started to think about their place in the universe, their cosmology, and how it was all related. And so we want to pay respects, like Alan said. And we'll extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders because this show is going live to events across the state and indeed beyond. So I just want to give shout outs to those of us watching at Delford, Bendigo, and Lisa's in Bendigo, so I hope everyone's going to do a big cheer now for you, Lisa. Um, Maryborough, Mornington Peninsula, uh, Emerald slash Mount Burnett Observatory, uh, Swan Hill and Whittlesea. Um, give yourselves a round of applause and everyone here at Mount Goat Brewery in Melbourne, give yourselves a round of applause as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good energy, yeah. I like it. Uh, so before we begin the science tonight, we first have to thank our, the people who made this possible, our sponsors. It just simply wouldn't be possible without them. So I'd like to thank Swinburne, Osgrad, Fleet, as well as the State Library of Victoria, our host for this evening, Mountain Goat Brewery, and of course, the Inspiring Australia um, uh, uh, Department as, as part of National Science Week itself. So, one last time, big round of applause for everyone who's sponsoring this. <laughs> All right, time for science. Together, yeah. Do you want to do the instructional? Yeah, why not? So, if you're like me and you haven't yet put your phone in your headset, now is a good time to do so. So I just want to remind everyone that um, we are up here, and I know a few of you guys, your orientation might be a little bit different from us depending on where you were looking when you started the app. So just remember that this is completely immersive, so you want to look up, down, Swivel side to side, hopefully don't elbow somebody's beer out of the way, but you know, don't just look forward because it's all around you. It's a big universe. <laughs> all right. So again, I want to remind everybody, if you're kind of looking at the screen, you really want to make sure that the white line that you see is lined up with this little indentation. That's going to make sure you get the best virtual reality experience. Yeah. Now, as you look into the app, the basic controls are you move your head and you move the white cursor. Now the silver button here on top, that's your little mouse button, if you will, your clicker. And so if you're looking at blank screen and you press the cursor, you'll bring up your menu. So this is the main way we'll navigate through the app tonight. And there are some little in-app scenes where we'll do some other navigation and I'll make sure I explain that to you there. And just for those of you who don't have one of the headsets, especially if you're joining us uh, live online, if you go to the little glasses icon at the bottom and you click that, don't take that, Addy, 
But if you click that, that will switch you to um, non the non-VR. So you can still enjoy tonight even without the headset. Yeah. You take it away? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm really excited. So tonight is all about the hidden universe, the invisible universe. And that's very fitting because of Ozdrav's main research. It's all about things that are fundamentally invisible. Yes. So we'll get to that. <coughs> but before we imagine the invisible, we thought it'd be fun to see, well, what you can see. <laughs> so without further ado. Yeah. So first we want to navigate to our home in the universe and our galaxy, the solar system. Everybody loves it. So if you just click on your menu, we're going to first go to solar system. And so then you're going to click again to navigate to that scene. So now you're going to look around and oh my gosh, there's the sun. And you can look around and you'll see the line of planets as Alan constantly reminds me, this is not to scale. <laughs> Jupiter is not this right is there. Absolutely not to scale. I just <laughs> have to emphasize that. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, our sun and why it's important. But does somebody want to shout out their favorite planet that they want to navigate to? Saturn. Saturn. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, somebody might have said something else first, but we're going to Saturn. You may notice there are eight planets, and that's because, people, there are only eight planets. All right, so any of the Pluto lovers out there, I'm eight sorry. Eight and a half. <laughs> so if you go to your menu inside this scene, now if you click, you'll see all of the eight planets lined up. So let's go down to Saturn. Wow. Okay, so mine, Saturn popped up right in front of me, and below it is a little infographic. And if you look around, you can see the magnificent rings. And Saturn is an incredible planet, um, not just because we had a spacecraft there that taught us a lot about the physics of gas giants, <laughs> but because of the structure of having this giant gas planet surrounded by these rings, actually help us understand a little bit probably about how the early solar system itself formed and the planets to replace the rings with like a planetary disk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys were uh, up on this, but we actually crashed the spacecraft that was orbiting Saturn into it. Intentionally. Yes, intentionally. intentionally. <laughs> I was getting there, but you know, Debbie was dramatic. <laughs> crashed it. Um, and we did this because, and I say we, <laughs> I didn't do it, the people, fabulous people at NASA and JPL, and this is because two of Saturn's moons, Enceladus and Titan, actually show signs of places where there could be primordial life. And we actually even thought Enceladus used to be just this frozen ice ball until Cassini, the spacecraft, shows us pictures of these geysers shooting out water hundreds of kilometers out into space. And so it's like, okay, well, the spacecraft is running out of fuel. We don't want it to accidentally crash into one of these moons and contaminate it. So crash it into Saturn. And that's what we did. That's right. Um, some other nice little features of Saturn. If you look up and you see those gaps in the rings, yeah. those are real gaps. This is because we have tiny little moons called shepherd moons, which are actually traveling through those gaps, hoovering up the material. The disk itself is made out of ice, dust, little bits of rock. That's essentially it. They all get collected, hoovered up by the gravity of those shepherd moons. Now, we might have time for one more yeah. quick planet. Is everyone looking back at the sun, by the way, and just enjoying the eclipse? Oh, I miss that. Yeah, or it, technically this is a transit, and yeah. this is a five-planet transit, which is the, obviously the sign of the apocalypse, so it's, it's not the sign of the apocalypse. We're on YouTube, I'm very worried about what's gonna get tagged and following this video. Um, so this is what, well, this is one way essentially you can find alien worlds. They block the stars by passing them between us and those stars. Just that tiny bit of dimming is enough for um, spacecraft like Kepler or indeed the new test that just launched to actually find alien worlds. So does anyone want another planet? Um, I should have pointed out, for people online and in all of our regional viewing yes. parties, please use the hashtag Ask Sci VR, S C I V R, and we will um, be interrupted with your question and uh, we will try to answer that in kind of semi breaks that we build in. Yeah. All right, so that's on Twitter, so please just use the hashtag. Anyone wanted a planet? Last planet? Uh, Neptune. Ne Neptune, all right, let's go. Let's go to Neptune. So again, just go to your menu and you can see Neptune called after the Roman god of the sea because it has this gorgeous blue color. 
And this is because Neptune is mostly made up of the gases methane and ethane, or I guess, how do you pronounce it in Australia? Methane and ethane? Yeah, there yeah, you go. Like normal people, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm from Ireland and I pronounce it right. I can't believe it. All right. Well, okay. I guess I am American. But what's really cool about Neptune is they've shown, I mean, even though it's extremely far away from the sun, it's a quite a large gas planet. And so you have a lot of pressure in the atmosphere. And the pressure is actually great enough that it could create diamonds. So think about that. On Earth, we only get diamonds far, far under the Earth's crust where there's vast amounts of pressure. It could happen in the atmosphere of this planet. So I'm not saying we should all go to Neptune, but... Well, it depends how much you really want diamonds, <laughs> right? I mean. yeah. Okay, so again, turn to look goodbye at the solar system, yes. the planets. Uh, Uranus is actually, is that angle, it's tilted, its rings are actually facing the sun. We actually still don't know why that's the case. Maybe a flyby, maybe collision, who knows? But one thing we can definitely say is we won't be telling you the answer tonight because we have to move on. Yeah. And now it's to another familiar site. Yes. So we're starting very close in, and now we're going to zoom out a little bit to the view of our galaxy. So we're going to navigate back to the home menu. Everybody uh, able to navigate heart. back to yeah. home? I see lots of hands on screen. Good. So now we're going to navigate to where it says all sky view. And when you enter all sky view, you're going to see the electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves all the way over to gamma waves. And if you hover over where the words are, where it says gleam, C and D, optical, you can actually click on that portion of the spectrum. And we're going to start in optical because that's what, when we look around us, that's the wavelength we see in. So our eyes are excellent detectors of this wavelength of light. And when we look at the galaxy in this wavelength, mostly what we see is the light of stars. Some like our sun, some which are more massive and bluer, and some which are much smaller, fainter, and redder. So as we look around, that is mostly what you're seeing. I'm trying to find where's the bulb. Yeah, so everyone has gone to the Milky Way, or sorry, to optical, and you can see the Milky Way. Can you see the fattest bit of the Milky Way? Should be roughly speaking in front of you, but everyone's gonna have a slightly different view. FY, you look fantastic, I just wanna say. <laughs> I've never had an audience so uninterested in apparently looking at the talk that I'm giving, and this is a great thing, great thing. Um, so the, the center of our galaxy is that fattest bulge, and there's a lot of dark regions, and this is the screen just to send for yeah. yourselves if you need to find it. Milky Way is vast, of course, we sit in it, so it stretches all around us, making it very challenging to view in your seats at the moment, but please don't stand up. Um, the dust lanes are blocking the light from countless millions, if not billions, in fact, of stars yeah. behind them, so that's what the dark regions are. It's not because there's no stars there, it's actually because there's dust blocking, blocking the starlight. Them. These are the regions where stars form, but you couldn't tell that from just optical light. No. So time to move on to the invisible universe. Because of technology, we've been able to, to develop detectors which allow us to see the universe around us in wavelengths we can't see with our eyes. And so one of those, if we go back to the spectrum and you go over to where it says radio wave, hover up and click on gleam. So radio is incredible because what we see a lot of times in radio are things which are either very faint, or I'll explain in a second, things which can be very energetic. But you're seeing a lot of the contribution of dust, which has been, was blocking us when we were looking at the stars, but now we can see it, the light has been re-emitted at fainter wavelengths. So now we can see the dust, okay? Yeah. Another important, very, very important material we can see with radio is the gas that actually makes up stars. And so we can use radio to map this gas and better understand the connection between the way stars are formed and that gas supply. So one uh, very energetic event uh, that Rebecca has alluded to, it's possible to see in radio, is Centaurus A. So to yeah. find that, I want you to go to look, pan across, in my case, it's panning to the right, going along with this, and then if you look up, you can see this giant yeah. thing that's a very technical this term for it. See. If you want to look at the TV to get an idea of what yeah. you're looking for. So this, 
Can everyone find that? Some people can, some people can't. You have to just keep turning around to the right and that's it. <laughs> what you're seeing here is something that is fundamentally invisible. Does anyone know what it is? Shout out the answer. Yeah, black hole. Black hole. <laughs> Deep at the heart of that object is a black hole. Ten, and many tens of millions of times the mass of our sun crushed into a region so dense that not even light can escape, and yet it's a very messy ether. As material flies in, it swirls around and then gets blasted into jets that stretch, um, actually, from tip to tail on this image, a million light years. This is an enormous structure in radio. It's one of the brightest sources your radio telescope will pick up. And now I want you, it's going to take some very, you know, uh, delicate tapping work on the yeah. trigger, but I want you to, while keeping that in sight, hit your button and switch to optical. And where does it go? Because none of you have seen that in the night sky, right? I think you'd probably remember that monstrous object. This does not shine in visible light, or at least not noticeably so. So radio telescopes are lined to see different sides of our universe, invisible, yeah. hidden sides to our everyday eyes. So before we move on to the next exciting scene, and we, we encourage you to explore because there's many different wavelengths of light that we can see our galaxy and the universe through. But before we move on to the next scene, we would like to field questions from the audience and also from our virtual audience. Yes, yeah, so using the hashtag ask VR. We have people who manage. Do we have, firstly, do we have any online questions coming in yet? Are they still beginning to run? Any online questions, Matt? Okay, cool. So you guys get first go. Unless you're too busy questions. looking at the chat. Any question on what you've seen through the night? Which is, to be fair, almost everything, right? <laughs> right at the back? So the question was, why does the dust emit radio waves? Um, basically, the dust is heated by the, the starlight. It gets warmer and it begins to glow. If you heat it up enough, it would glow red hot. Keep heating it, it would eventually glow blue hot, right? If you have a, sto a stove top and you keep heating it. This thing is heated to, what is it, like 10 degrees Kelvin or something? Yeah, yeah so like minus 260 degrees Celsius. So very cold. So it emits very low energy light. Yeah. And the lowest energy light, the longest wavelength, is radio. Um, there are other ways that gas and dust can emit radio, but that's the primary, what we call black body radio. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> okay, uh, so the question, so <laughs> I'll just really enjoy the question. Why is Centaurus A um, so visible when other black holes are not. In particular, of course, the one at the center of our galaxy, yeah. Sagittarius A star, uh, sitting in the center of the Milky Way. Do you want it? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> so That's not an easy question. It's because um, Centaurus A is feeding. It is yeah. actively accreting, pulling in material, um, and that is essentially driving, powering this outburst yeah. of energy. So it's growing larger, but it is a messy eater, so it actually throws most of its material out, like any newborn, to be honest. <laughs> More goes everywhere than goes in their mouth. <laughs> and this is true even of an all devouring gravitational uh, hole. So this differs from Sagittarius A, which, let's quickly zoom towards. So all sky view, um, go click on the words radio waves. And this is now the cold dust, uh, sorry, the cold gas that forms um, stars. And if you go to the center of the galaxy, you'll see this thing zoom in. This is the latest observation by the first step towards the square kilometer array, the largest telescope will ever be built, likely. And this is the South African effort called Meerkat. And already at this first stage, it's made one of the most beautiful yeah. images of the center of our galaxy. All sorts of crazy antics going on, stars forming, some exploding, it's probably some, it probably looks like an H2 region. Anyway, right at the center, 
where it looks like it's going bananas, that is not the black hole. That is just the rest of the stuff going bananas, like stars exploding and the like. In there, our black hole is actually quaint, is quiescent, we call it. It's not feeding, which is a good thing. If it was, there's potential amounts of harmful gamma rays we could actually receive yeah. from this feeding black hole. In fact, black holes, when they feed, can be so energetic, pump out so much radiation, they blast away all of the gas in the entire galaxy, stop star formation everywhere, and ultimately would have stopped our sun forming had it been feeding five billion years ago. So you can be thankful it's on a diet. And that's why it's so hard to see. All right. All right. So we've discussed a little bit you know, where we are in our galaxy, and we've looked at our galaxy. But we're using, you know, what did you say, millions of light years, these really yeah. huge numbers. And so just to kind of get an appreciation of this scale, of stars and planets, we're going to now navigate back to home. And we're gonna go to a scene called Bigger Than Big. So this is one where you're, you're gonna really look around. So you probably, if you're like me, I'm staring right at the sun. And so you're gonna look around and to the right of the sun is the most massive, largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. And as you can see, it is still dwarfed compared to our star. And if you keep looking to the right, you'll see Earth. Okay, so very tiny compared to Jupiter and our star. But stars, their size is what makes them special. They're these giant balls of gas. And because they're so large, they have so much pressure that at their cores, they're actually able, woo! Walk this way. <laughs> Get a little psychedelic there. Yeah. He's gonna stand in front of the television now. Oh no, can you hear me? Yeah. So. Okay, I'll just, anyway. So what happens in the center of stars is that there's so much pressure that atoms are actually smushed together. And so you can form heavier and heavier elements. And as a byproduct of that fusion, we get the light, the radiation that we see from the star. And so to see exactly what's going on, if we now click our cursor anywhere, you'll see Stellar interior. So if you click on stellar interior, you say, oh gosh, it's really black in here. All right, and then look, turn around a little bit, and you should be able to see a periodic table. This is a science lecture after all. Yeah. All right. So we figured we'd give you a little chemistry too. So on the periodic table, we can see all the elements that we know of. And if you look down, you might see what could be a core. And so if you notice on the periodic table, we have hydrogen, helium, and lithium are all lit up in green. These are the elements that we started with in the universe. Everything else came, came <laughs> from lithium. fusion inside of a star or another extremely energetic event like that. And so if we start on helium and you hover your cursor over helium and then press it, you will see a very simple structure. Okay, two electrons, two Come. protons, and two neutrons. Yeah, we can start with hydrogen too. Hydrogen's even more simple. Yep. There we go. Just a lonely proton. Okay, but then if you want to see something heavier, perhaps you'd go to, let's see, carbon. Oh, yep. All right, now if we want. Everyone knows that that is C, yeah? We, yeah. We all knew that. <laughs> that was a test. Now we have much heavier nucleus. And for a star like our sun, it would, if it's lucky, get to carbon before its life would be over. And it would poof out its outer atmosphere and what would be left would be a little compact object called a white dwarf. Now, if we were in a much larger star, we could keep making elements all the way up to iron. But there's still a lot more elements on that periodic table, so why do we stop at iron? That's because the whole point of smushing stuff together is that it produces energy, and that energy balances the massive gravity of the star that really wants to collapse on itself. So once you get to iron, that reaction changes. You're actually taking energy to smash those atoms together, and it doesn't like that. And so what happens is that gravity wins, and the outer layers collapse in on it, on the core, and then you get a supernova. Okay. And in that supernova, we can get heavier elements that are made. Mm -hmm. And then 
and even more extreme events, we get the rest of them. Yeah. So we'll show you some more extreme events soon. Yeah. The, um, and in fact, uh, Coldy from um, Bendigo just tweeted, and I just saw that come up on my screen. Um, we will answer that question about what happens when two stars collide yeah. uh, or two neutron stars very soon. But I, I want to jump back to exterior, because I, we talked about black holes yep. and then white dwarfs. But there's another remnant of a massive star that's very special and that's something that we're going to continue to talk about. So if we go back to exterior, and we're looking now again at our star of blue giant, and then if we want to come back to Earth, now there's something whizzy next to Earth. What's going on here? Yeah, so remember, if you put your cursor over this tiny little object beside Earth, it zooms in, and you can see there's a tiny little ball that's whizzing around. It's turning, it's just rotating around. This is a neutron star. This is the dead core of a star, maybe eight times the mass of our sun, maybe slightly larger. All of its inner material, essentially the same amount of material as the sun itself, crushed into something the size of Melbourne. That incredible density is spinning around, and it fires jets just like the black hole I described earlier. And what we're seeing are those jets firing up, and then as the uh, neutron star spins around, you get that nice twirly pattern forming. So we're seeing this in radio waves in particular. Now, if one of those um, beams of, of radio light swept over you like a lighthouse, then you would see a pulse every time. In fact, you'd see one pulse, and then the southern tail of that. Um, so you see two pulses per one rotation. That's why we call it a pulsar, because astronomers are just not that creative. We see the majesty of the universe, and we go a thing that pulses, pulsar. Uh, this kind of like gravitational hole, not, light can't really escape from, black hole. So yeah, we're not very creative. But this pulsar acts like a very accurate clock. This is the ticking of the clock, the sweeping around of the lighthouse beam. We can do some very exciting things with those pulsars, which we'll talk about in a bit. Yes. I, I do want to point out that we can't see the pulse from the pulsar in visible light. This is detected in radio. So again, having that special that detector that can see that wavelength of light enables us to actually be able to see these objects. Because what you're left with after this massive star dies is a tiny, tiny object that would be incredibly difficult to see with a normal telescope. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it's worth bearing in mind, um, it's so small that this is still not to scale. Yeah. Um, we've tried, but it's yeah. really still not to scale. The other thing is, if that pulsar was that close to us on Earth, it would still have the mass, a sun's, a ma a sun's worth of mass. Its gravity would be immense and would whip us around and yeah. probably just tear us apart, actually. Yeah. So for several reasons, it's a good thing that the pulsars are not that close to Earth. And in Absolutely. fact, they're usually thousands of light years away, but they're that bright that we can see them and use them as accurate clocks on the other side of the galaxy itself. Yeah. So before we go into a little bit more about the significance of you know, these really compact objects and what happens when you get two of them, we want to take time to answer a few more questions. So uh, before we get to our audience here, do we have any more questions from online? I can't see. Uh, Neve from Bendigo wants to know why do suns collapse? Because they feel like it. No. <laughs> it's just been a rough day. Uh, because the idea is that you have something that's so heavy that it literally it can't support itself. Like we have our skeleton which supports us. Stars are so heavy that they really want to just collapse on themselves. But because of that fusion that in what's called radiative pressure that actually holds the star up, and it's what's fighting gravity until you get to a heavier element, such as iron, where it takes energy. And so then you don't get that radiation pressure anymore, and gravity is able to win. Yep, and in the case of suns, um, they get to you know carbon, maybe a touch of nitrogen, oxygen if they're lucky, and they just don't have the condition to actually burn heavier, ever heavier elements. Um, so they just die away and leave behind the white dwarf core, which yeah. is Again, you know, something a little lighter than a sun, but not too much, but about the size of the Earth. So still an extreme event, yeah. and it's basically one giant carbon, nitrogen, oxygen crystal. Yeah. So it's a nice future for our sun, even if it is very much terminal. Yeah, right at the back. Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, let me quickly, thanks for <laughs> skipping off the reservation there. Uh, okay, so all sky view, x-ray, black band. Oh, yeah, right. So the black band is the plane of the Milky Way, and it's been um, excised from this image simply because, I guess, there's too just bright. so much x-rays, yeah. it's just too bright for the telescope. Um, so this is uh, the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, yeah. So that would just be essentially one giant white stripe, um, which isn't that interesting. But that was stripped from NASA's archive, not us. We did not do that. Censored. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> NASA find aliens there. Who knows? <laughs> yes. Good one. Okay, so the question was, um, we mentioned that there was the hydrogen, helium, and lithium were produced in the Big Bang. Um, every other element heavier is produced in stars, or stars exploding in some way, or the leftovers of stars. Um, and that includes the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones, the oxygen you're breathing. You are quite literally made of star stuff. The hydrogen is like 15% by mass. It's tiny. Um, it actually formed in something we call Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So this is the idea. For the first couple of minutes of the universe's existence, it was in such a hot, dense state. No? Okay. No. All right. I thought I was going to get more people singing. Um, that it was essentially the conditions of a star, the center of a star. So it could actually begin to fuse. So you had the hydrogen, which is formed from the decay of inflation particles, inflat inflatons. Don't worry about that too much. Slightly went off topic. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, nucleosynthesis of the universe itself gives you the, the helium lithium. Great question. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned lithium. Um, lithium is talked about a lot these days about we need lithium for batteries. Yep. But there's a lithium cap. What's going on there? Right. So, uh, so the question was lithium is all important. We hear about it all the time for lithium batteries and the like. Um, but there's a lithium gap. Do you mean lithium in terms of the availability on Earth? There's less lithium than we expect. So, oh, there's less cosmic... Yeah, 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 there's less lithium in the universe, for sure. Um, and that's because lithium is burned up um, in the actual end days of yeah. Big Bang nucleosynthesis and in future stellar generations of stars as well. So it's depleted all the time. So there's actually less lithium than what we began with. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, we're not using up the lithium on Earth. We're combining it chemically. But in the rest of the universe, they're actually changing, they, whatever it is, <laughs> is changing the lithium to other elements. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lithium is, uh, it's not that rare, it's just quite well spread out, mm. not making it economically viable to mine it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, was there any other questions? I'll just quickly check. Oh, there's one yet. Yay! Yeah. Okay. Would this be at a Karina? Oh, I don't know if it's Ida Karina. Yeah. yeah, so the question, if you want to repeat it, but. So what she was asking is that there was a, a recent announcement about a, a star that went supernova again and they thought it had died down. And what can happen just generally is, so after a star goes supernova, especially if you have like a neutron star, you still have this very hot core. And so if there's something nearby, matter can actually fall onto that and you'll get another explosion. So what could be is that we probably thought, oh, there's nothing else around it, it'll be fine. And then we were wrong. And it shredded something, and it fell into the surface and blew up again. Yeah, so you can have these repeated novae. Yeah. Um, most cases, a supernova is, a, is definitely a one-time only deal. It's quite ex explosive, yeah. to say the least. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can actually get it wrong, and you can see multiple events. I think the second time was the last time, though, right? I don't think. I'm asking you, I don't know, that's maybe putting you on the spot, right? <laughs> no, but these are really extreme environments, and a lot of what we know about them is really through simulations, because uh, we're just now trying to send a probe to our star, and so it's really complicated, the stellar physics, and understanding what's going to trigger it. I mean, even trying to get a supernova to explode in models uh, is very tricky. So it's something, it's like, oh, okay, well, we're learning something new by seeing that. Awesome. All right. So speaking of supernova and stellar remnants, we want to get on to the next scene. Mm -hmm. 
which is about when two compact objects love each other very, very much. Okay? <laughs> and so it's extreme enough when you have one compact object, like a white dwarf or a black hole or a neutron star, because it warps what we call space time, so the fabric of space, the thing we're all in, and what our mass bends. Well, the more mass you have, the more you bend it, and these compact objects exaggerate it quite a bit. And so what happens is that when you have two of these compact objects close to each other, and they're within an orbit, so they're gravi what we call gravitationally bound, like our moon is bound to us, but they're on what's called a decaying orbit, so they're getting closer and closer, and one day they'll collide. And so what happens in this instance was actually predicted by Einstein. Yep. And that is that the energy that comes from the decay of that orbit is actually dispersed into space-time itself as something called a gravitational wave. Now, you would think, you know, just like you have a wave on a boat or two boats circling and you get this really rocky water, well, you think it would just shake up everything. But actually, the effect is so small that Einstein predicted we would never detect it. Well, leave you on a little bit of a cliffhanger. We're gonna go to the next scene and we're gonna see how it was detected. Spoiler. <laughs> okay, so if we go to home, Again, now we're going to go to LIGO. Now, LIGO is a very large scene, and I mean that because there's plenty of little, you'll see a little eye with a circle. Those are little information bubbles, and that's because there's a lot, a lot of information, a lot of factoids about the detector, uh, how was it built, history of gravitational waves, and we can see the detector itself here. So you see, what you'll see is you, if you look around, what kind of look like two gongs, but are actually mirrors. And if we look down at that, that is our detector. So what is a gravitational wave detector? In essence, it's a, just a very, very accurate ruler, or to be precise, two rulers sitting at 90 degrees apart. And those two tracks are the two rulers. Now, they don't look much like rulers, but as Rebecca said, the uh, gravitational waves as they pass through, they'll stretch space time. So for example, right now they're traveling through me, making me taller and thinner, which is great, quite frankly. Um, I've let myself go recently. <laughs> but then as the wave continues by, I actually get squashed and fatten out. And that's just life. <laughs> now you haven't noticed this happening to me because the effect is absolutely tiny. Einstein predicted this a century ago, and as Rebecca said, predicted you never notice it yeah. or detect it because that straining and stretching is a thousandth of the size of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Or to put it in another way, it's equivalent from here to the nearest star changing by a hair's width. And that's what LIGO ended up detecting. So how did it detect that? Yeah. How could you detect that? slight change in distance, well, you have these very accurate rulers or lasers. Yeah. So you can turn on the lasers by going to the view and hitting the green button. There we go. So we see the laser light shoots down, um, hits that little disc in the, mirror, uh, in the middle, it's called a beam splitter. That sends two light rays. They bounce, they travel four kilometers, bounce off the mirror, travel back, and then pass um, off to the detector on the right, which is glowing red. In reality, if those distances are absolutely perfect, they are exactly four kilometers each, then the, um, the peak of one wave will fill in the gap, the trough of the other, and the laser light, and actually they cancel out. This is known as destructive interference. So actually that reddish glow would be completely black mm -hmm. if they perfectly balanced. This tells you when we built the scene that we haven't got this exactly to four kilometers each way. <laughs> now the idea is, just as I get taller and thinner as a gravitational wave passes through me, and then squash and fatten, one arm will get stretched relative to the other, right? One gets taller, the other gets thinner or shorter, and vice versa. So you'll actually measure their distances change as a gravitational wave, this ripple in space-time pass through it. So okay. how do you do that? So let's see it happen. If you look down where we started the detector and you look over to the right, you'll see create binary. So this is going to create our two compact objects which are on a path to destroy each other. And if you, you need to kind of look up from where it says create binary to see them. So I'm looking at two black holes that are swirling together. 
Now, so it's kind of a little bit tricky, so you want to look at them swirling and getting closer, and then look back down at our grid and our detector, and you'll start to notice that grid deform. And as the black holes get closer and closer and are rotating faster and faster, you see the deformation happen a lot more quickly until finally... The whole scene's shaking, the whole world's trembling. The that. light is flickering that's surviving this uh, giant event. And that flickering of the light is what we can actually measure. Yeah. And that's how we can detect gravitational waves. We turn that flickering light into a sound, and it just so happens it's in the audible range, and it sounds like whoop. And that's it. <laughs> there was a, almost exactly on the centenary of Einstein's prediction, two black holes around 30 times the mass of our sun each collided in their final millisecond as they spun around each other at two-thirds of the speed of light. They collide and they release about three entire sun's worth of mass as pure energy. In that moment, they outshine every single star in the universe combined. And those waves traveled a billion years, and by the time they hit our detector, they went whoop. <laughs> the biggest explosion humanity has ever witnessed. Yeah. And it is by far and away the least impressive sound you will ever hear. <laughs> They're very weak. <laughs> if, so. you, if you uh, click create binary again, you should be able this time, instead of seeing two black holes, you'll see two pulsars. And so what's at the whole heart of those pulsars are neutron stars. And recently, there was a detection of a gravitational wave of the collision of two neutron stars. And we learned something amazing. So first of all, we've been talking about the detector. So we get this detection, and we have the, the very manly chart, OK? And then we can break that down and decode it and work backwards and find out what kind of collision would make that sound. That's how we know what's collided and how big it was. And in the case of the neutron stars, there was actually a visual counterpart. Yeah. And what we were able to establish is that, well, you keep saying this, like the world's worth of gold. An, an entire Earth's, Earth's worth, worth of gold. gold. Like not just the gold reserves on Earth. I mean, all of the Earth yeah. as pure gold was created in that moment of the collision. Yeah. So diamonds in Neptune, gold in this thing that's a billion light years away. Get traveling. <laughs> you want the perfect engagement ring. No. And it's worth pointing out, that, yes, is where the gold in your jewelry comes from. That's literally from a collision of these neutron stars before our sun was even born. So it's pretty special. But what I think is actually amazing, besides the fact that we're detecting the most massive things colliding and smooshing together, is that we're not using, OK, this gravitational wave is, is distorting space time. This isn't detecting through light. So yes, we're using lasers to see space move, but this is an entire new view of our universe. For so long, so much of what we've learned in astronomy is based on light, whether it's visible light, radio light, or even you know, gamma rays and x-rays. Now we have a window that isn't light at all. And that's, and that's incredible. And so, in, yeah, an entirely new sense. Yeah. It's different from taste is to touch is to sight. Now we can listen out into the universe. As far, so far as we know, this has never been done by any creature or, or <laughs> you know, random event in nature. We yeah. are the first things in all of the universe's history to listen in with gravitational waves. Yeah. So you should feel very special to live in this time. Yeah. We have so many questions that have okay, come through. OK, so let's, <laughs> yeah, before we you know, go off on our little <clears throat> Oh, gosh. Um, so while you pick a good one off social, does yep. somebody in the audience have a question? I know we just blew your minds. Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. So he was asking, OK, so our idea of a black hole is everything goes in, nothing comes out. Um, and so when they collide, why is there so much energy that's released? Yeah, that's so it's question. basically in the swirl of space-time itself. So in the same way that you 
um, put your hand in water yeah. and you move it back and forth, you, or you try to make a rotation of that water, it's going to cost you energy, right? It you can, you'll get tired if you keep doing it. Yeah. In a very similar way, the effect of the black holes to actually kick up the ripples in space-time itself, that demands energy. And all they have is what they're made, their own yeah. mass. And that, that's essentially how that gets powered. Um, it's a little bit, I said essentially, it's a lot more complex than that, sorry. Well, but that's an, a, rough, a rough kind of analogy that I can understand at least. And what's left is less massive oh, yeah, than what yeah. began. So part oh, yeah. of that does go in. The gravitational the wave, sorry. With the gravitational waves, we don't just, for the very first time I should have pointed out that we actually know the black holes are there. We can weigh the black holes. We can measure how they collided together. Um, everything else is inference. Even those jets could potentially be powered by something else. It's kind of it would be extreme. I talked about Centaurus A, but this is at least a definitive for the very first time that black holes are real, and they're exactly as Einstein described. Um, and uh, Henry from uh, Mornington Peninsula wants to know how a black hole is formed. Basically, you cram enough stuff into a small enough region, and its gravity increases so much not even light can escape, and it will um, then be called a black hole. To do that kind of squeezing is incredibly challenging, so it's only in the most massive stars that their centers collapse and get squeezed on ever tighter and ever denser. Um, they can either squeeze into a neutron star, but, and then it explodes as a supernova, or they can squeeze in just that little bit more to form a black hole. And exactly when they form the black hole versus everything else is a little depends on a few different things. Basically, if you're 10 times the mass of our sun, you are forming a black hole. Yeah. Um, and one more before I pass on, because I can see people are over here. Um, Chloe from Whittlesea asks, why are there different kinds of light? Oh, so there's different kinds of light. It all has to do with energy. And the more energy you have, the shorter and more frequent your wavelength is going to be. So it has to do with literally the energy in something. And like when our star is fusing these elements, it's not just creating visible light. Okay, there's all kinds oh, of yeah. other light that come out of that. Yeah, like, like ultraviolet, right? Yeah. Which is why you slips off, slips off slap. Slips off slap? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, so there was a question at the back and then we've got so many more online. I didn't hear that. What's the time it? scale of the black hole collision like we were looking at? I mean, it's super sped up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> super, the, super sped up. Uh, the, the final sort of few rotations, if you like, are occurring on milliseconds, um, fractions of millisecond. And in fact, that's the frequency that you're hearing, the audible frequency. That's the rising chirp where it goes to higher pitches, like whoop, or rather whoop, as they collide. Um, that that is literally that speed of their rotating around, how many times they do that a second, 500 times a second or 1,000 times a second by the end. And that just translates to sign. So I am not a musician, but if I was, I would know what key frequency, I don't really know the terminology, that would correspond to. I think it's like, I'm going to say middle A, but who knows. <laughs> Someone knows, not me. Yep. Okay, so the question was, the laser used in LIGO um, has a certain wavelength, certain color of light. Um, why don't you use a, a higher frequency, shorter wavelength, it's a bluer colored laser? Mm. Um, one very good reason, and sorry, by the way, the, the, while you would ramp up the energy, um, you get to shorter wavelengths, you'd be more precise, the bluer the colored laser. They're harder to make, but most importantly, as you ramp up the energy of the laser, you push the mirror by light, the pressure of light itself. And this is such an accurate measurement. You will actually overwhelm the gravitational waves changing that distance, right? From here to the nearest star, the width of a hair, it's moved. 
you will push the mirror more if you ramp up the energy of that laser. There's ways around it. You, well, you build bigger mirrors, actually. Um, one way to do it. And those mirrors, by the way, were created in Australia. So we should feel very proud um, of that achievement. Um, we're going to have to move on because we've got 10 minutes left. Um, someone asked, she's, what is the difference between dark energy and dark matter? Nice try. We're not covering that in 10 minutes. Um, it's uh, dark. Oh, Anthony from Bendigo wants to know what will happen to the galaxy when the black hole in the middle, the center, sucks everything in. We won't be here. <laughs> it won't happen. Yeah. Black holes don't suck. No. They, uh, <laughs> no, I mean literally, like it doesn't. They, if, if our sun was to become a black hole tomorrow, then the Earth's orbit wouldn't change. Yeah. We would keep going around. It only has the gravity it has. There's no sort of magic sort of evil, nefarious claws that come out and pull stuff in. Yep. It's just gravity. I think we have one more question over here. Yep. So the mass of the black hole we know is created by, well, black hole is created by an immense amount of mass. Is that mass an element on the periodic table, or is it something that's just so far beyond that it's created? Yeah. No, that's, a, that's actually yep. a great question that Stephen Hawking uh, was Repeat one of the- Repeat the question. Yeah, oh, okay, sorry. So he was asking, you know, the mass of the black hole, like what is it created from? Is there a special element that's just so massive that it creates the black hole? And actually, it's very hard to know because once it is a black hole, we don't have the information of what went into it. And some might argue uh, that the information is lost forever. Um, but some might argue that the information is there, it's just in another universe. So either way, it would be very difficult for us to understand that. And essentially, all we can tell from the outside of the black hole is its mass, its rotation, and its electric charge. And so the answer is many different things can make black holes of different masses. Um, working backwards and figuring out what went into that is not possible okay. now. It's possible that the, that it, that the matter exists as something that we already know, but the, the gravitational pull of it is so mm. Okay, yeah, so, so, yeah, so basically when the, if you get an atom that falls into a black hole, the gravity becomes so strong it will pull the electron away from yeah. the proton, so you have a hydrogen atom, and rip that apart, and arguably by the time you get to the very center of the black hole, we have what's called the singularity, right. and that means there's just, we don't know of any way to stop it from further collapsing, so eventually all of that mass reaches a tiny volume, quite literally a volume of no size, yeah. its gravity is infinite, it can overwhelm everything, it's all, go it's all over. It's, it's, you know, you can't put a singularity in the periodic table, but if you could, it would probably destroy the periodic table too, right? So, yeah, um, yeah so, but the reason we think, well, we just don't know because our yeah. physics breaks down at that point because we don't have what's called a quantum theory of gravity, but someone here or online, I hope, will be able to do that. It escaped Einstein, it escaped um, uh, Hawking, but hopefully you will have your chance. Go to uni, study physics, join the team at Osgrav. Go to uni at Swinburne, go to the... I was going to say. Um, I'm going to rip through these questions very quickly. Zoe from Bendigo wants to know how many moons are orbiting all the planets. I don't know. Lots. We keep finding ever more. Yeah. Um, Jupiter, Jupiter is like now the most. Yeah, it's, we just find another dozen, and we're not careless. Saturn's they're just so close. Yeah, <laughs> we're just, they're just <laughs> tiny. Um, so we're finding more all the time. But we're, there's prob there'll be hundreds. Depends where you cut, cut off on the size. Um, Cadell from Bendigo wants to know how bright is a dying star. Um, mm. If it dies as a supernova, it is brighter than the galaxy it resides in, or at least for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's all the ones we're gonna to get to because we're nigh on six minutes. Yeah, well, so before we wrap up and actually take a few more questions, and we have some questions for you, so don't think you got out of this without... <laughs> yeah, it's not a one-way street, <laughs> You can people. ask us Come as on. many as we want. We got some for you. There's one more scene. So we're talking about these detections, and as of right now on Earth, there are two gravitational wave detectors. And oh, there's three. Oh, there's three. Two making up LIGO. Okay, two making up the LIGO. The Europeans just built one. Yeah. They just built one. Okay, so there's three. Um, but how do we know where the gravitational wave is coming from? So there's this whole question of what we call localization. Where is it? And it, this is really important if we detect a gravitational wave and we want to see if there's any visual counterpart or if we want to be able to, to understand more about what, what, what was that happened after that collided. And so if we go to our menu and we go to 
GW sky maps. That's literally gravitational wave sky maps. And the first one is literally at your feet. And you will see it is a smudge. It is not a pinpoint. Yeah. And this is because with the two detectors Rebecca mentioned in LIGO, one on the east coast of America, one on the west coast uh, of the US, the one, say, if the one on the east coast hears the detection first and then the west coast, say a millisecond later, or the light travel time, then from which direction is the black hole coming from, the explosion? We hear it over here and then here, that away, all right? So we can look backwards to the where, from where the black hole came. But with only two detectors, it's really hard to be accurate. And in fact, high accurate, well, as accurate as that yellow band. Yeah. Hiding in that region of the night sky are millions of galaxies. We have no hope of trying to figure out from exactly which one did the black hole collision occur in. Yeah. But we got a third yeah. detector come online. And with three detectors, you can triangulate, clues in the name, and between figuring out when they all heard the black hole signal, we can pinpoint. And to see that, go to um, click your home, go to GW170817, catchy, I know. And then look up uh, for me, it was, uh, it's, it's off like my down right. Down. Yeah, there it is, yeah. So it's far more localized. Um, and basically, it's sitting in a region of space that we could actually turn telescopes to look at and catch the afterglow of light. So we saw it in, in fact, most frequencies of light, colors of light imaginable from gamma rays all the way down to radio. That was the colliding neutron stars. The ones that released in that split second of their collision all of this gold, well, they also released yeah. all of this light. And for the very first time, we heard the collision in gravitational waves and saw it in light, taking the hidden universe and combining it with the very much real and observed universe. And with that, we learned so much more about those extreme objects. Yeah. Um, we are going to have to blitz, yeah. go home, go to fleet. Um, Fleet is the um, center of excellence uh, in future low energy electronics technologies. In other words, Fleet are trying to create a new generation of ways to have computers that don't use up all the battery life like my smartphone has and has nearly died from running our app all day. Um, this is a little sneak peek of some of its um, laboratories. There's lots of information. They're doing cool things with lasers, yeah. just like the gravitation wave teams. Um, as well as the um, scanning, tunneling, uh, scanning tunneling microscopes to zoom in on atom scales. Yeah. Little sneak peek behind the scenes, because you can't actually go here because it's super clean labs. Yeah. Um, we are going to ask you yeah. questions. So. So wait, hold on a minute. So can uh, one of my Osgrad volunteers take pictures because I'm actually blinded by the light. So we just want to, yeah, thank you, Carl. Get a couple audience pictures. Because so, we're going to cut, sorry, is everyone okay with the pictures? If not, just put the thing over your face. Yeah, but we're not, we're not going to use these in for is just your counting. Hands. We want to be able to count your hands. I don't want to have to do it now. So we're just going to have you with a show of hands for each question very quickly and just We'll take snaps and we'll figure out. And, and the reason we're asking you these questions is because cyber was actually, like we said, it's part of National Science Week and it's part of a grant. And so the, the goal of this is to reach new audiences and to enhance you know, your experience and enjoyment of science. And so we want to know if we did a good job tonight. And I could tell you to go to the survey website, but I can tell after a few beers it's probably easier to do it this way. All right, OK. So. With a show of hands, have you attended a National Science Week event before? Hands up, real high. All right, you got them. Has this event made it more likely that you'll attend a National Science Week event in future? Hey! Um, keep your hand, thank you. Have you used VR technology before? Oh, wow. Wow, that's amazing. You gotta okay. step it up. You guys keep your hands up in the corner. Um, all right. Did the VR tonight help your understanding of the science? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's really loved that science. <laughs> awesome. 
All right, penultimate question. Did you enjoy tonight? We don't take yays, by the way, sadly. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just statistics, I'm afraid. And of course, finally, will you come back if we do it again next year? Yeah. Awesome. Great. All right. So with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Fleet, Osgrave, Swinburne, the State Library of Victoria, and of course, our host for this evening, Montego Brewery, and Inspiring Australia through the National Science Week Grant. Huge round of applause for them all. And I'd like to thank our volunteers, Addy, Renee, Will, Debattery, Daniel, um, J Jackie, I don't know uh, wherever you've gone, Jackie, too. Lisa in Bendigo, thank you so much for traveling there. Um, Roel, and of course my co-host, Rebecca. Another huge round of applause for them all. And finally, a huge round of applause for you all for coming and making possible something crazy, which is to explore science in a brewery. Thank you very much. And uh, right. we'll stick around to answer a few questions. And if you guys really enjoyed tonight, there's a guy, Mark, and there's this guy, Carl. Buy them a beer because they made all of this happen. Thank you, guys. No, I don't thank Carl and Mark. Oh my god, I didn't thank you two! I'm so sorry! I had a special thanks and I had it was all beautiful. Oh, I stuffed that. Making the app, the video, the audio, the photography, um, I think also held me while I cried at one point. Could you give a please huge round of applause for Mark and Carl? Oh. And if you have any questions, our volunteers are in blue jumpers yeah. and blue t-shirts. Please ask them or come up to us or just use the hashtag AskCyber yeah. and we will answer those questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for joining us online as well. Have a merry National Science Week.